The boxers have been given their instructions. The signs are out. The crowd is ready for another edition of Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing with your presenter, the boxing historian, Greg Rasheed. What a cup to everyone out there. This is Greg Rashid with another edition of the Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. Heard by so many of you at your convenience. And I want to say thank you to everyone that's listened to the program. You really, I mean, it makes me feel so good. And, and I just appreciate how so many folks love this program. And we do what we can here. And I want to say a special shout out, as always, to my Patreon, my first Patreon who's the promoter of this program, and I'm talking about the one and only Al Red Sox fan. And he has a great, great YouTube site. Check it out. Al Red Sox fan. Just a great guy. And my first Patreon. But you can become a Patreon too. Just go to patreon.com. Look for Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. There I am. And contribute uh, what you can. A dollar a month, whatever you can. Really helps. Also, go to my buymeacoffee.com site and contribute what you can, a dollar a month, whatever you can. We're hoping, I'm hoping that the Saudis are listening in. They can contribute a whole lot as they're doing right now in revitalizing boxing. But we always have fun on this program. And again, I'm in Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand. And we do the shows. Um, it's all about imagination. It's nothing here except for when we talk about what's going on currently in boxing and other combat sports. Everything here is, a, is what if, fantasy. What would happen if Muhammad Ali fought Vladimir Klitschko? What would have happened if Larry Holmes fought Mike Tyson when they were in their prime? What would have happened? And that's what we do in this program. We use various modalities to just imagine, simulate fights, and today we're using a great simulation. All these simulations I use are great. They're usually computer games or card and dice games. I'm using a great card and dice game, Glory Days Boxing. You can get on glorydaysboxing.com. Look for Glory, Glory Days Games created by Anthony Crooks. That's a wonderful guy to talk to, very personable and has a great game, and you, you, we're using this today to simulate this particular event, which will be a Father's Day special, because I want to say Happy Father's Day. If you're listening to this show on Sunday, June the 16th, I have to look at my calendar to make sure, because I'm over here in Thailand, and I'm a day ahead of everyone, but June the 16th is Father's Day in America. We don't have that over here, but I want to say hi to those who are listening in, on June 16th, especially those who listen in every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Mountain Time on KUHSDenver.com, created by the one and only Henry Archer Letter. And I've been on this station for so long, and I really love this station. I love the folks there and really support them. Besides, I mean, they have so many great programs on there. Check them out. Check them out. But we got this great program today. Show the World Virtual Boxing Podcast. And if you're, if I know, you're listening to the program, so therefore, you are a boxing fan. And that's what we talk about on here, boxing. But we also play music at the end of the show. We just go into a lot of music some of you have never heard of, but it's um, fun. That's all this is, fun. It's all imagination. But before we get to the event itself, what we're going to do today as we always do, we're going to give you a little bit of the current boxing news. And today we'll have Natasha talking about what's going on in the world of boxing. Starting with the something I didn't even know about, the Juneteenth belt. I didn't even know about this. So let, he, let's hear uh, Natasha talk about that on the Show the Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. I'm your presenter, Greg Rashid. Juneteenth commemorates June 19th, 1865 
The day enslaved people in Texas finally learned of their freedom, marking the end of slavery in the United States. The WBC created the Juneteenth Belt and named it Freedom. It was presented on June 19, 2021 in Houston, Texas, and was awarded to Jermal Charlo as he won his fight versus Juan Macias Montiel. That same week President Biden announced the confirmation of Juneteenth becoming a national holiday day. The WBC created the 2022 version, which was scheduled for the fight to be held on such holiday. It was Jermal Charlo versus Selecki, which unfortunately was cancelled due to a back injury. In 2023, there was no fight scheduled on June. The 2024 edition has been presented to the Russell's Boxing Dynasty as a way to honour the memory and efforts of Mr. Gary Russell Sr., who passed on May 2022. Gary Russell Jr., the former WBC featherweight champion from 2015 through 2022 accepted the belt for the family. With his love and care, he guided his sons and they became champions. He was also a pillar of boxing for his community. A dynasty family, really great boxing family and great for the community in the D.C. area. And I, I really didn't know about this belt. So I was really surprised, the Juneteenth belt. But that's good, good kudos for them for doing that. But right now we're going to get to another story uh, Natasha's going to talk about. And this is about Clarissa Shields, an uh, event that uh, she may do, but she said, you got to give me the money. So let's hear what Natasha says about this. Clarissa Shields would require a staggering sum of money to ditch the gloves and fight bare knuckle. The original form of boxing is undergoing a huge revival in the modern age. Since Jim Freeman and Joe Brown of BKB, now BYB Europe, professionalized the sport in 2015, bare knuckle boxing has exploded in popularity. It is now the fastest growing combat sport in the world, and its profile has only been boosted further by Conor McGregor's involvement. The former two-weight UFC champion recently became a part owner of Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship, BKFC, who are no strangers to signing big names. Former UFC lightweight title holder Eddie Alvarez and ex-gloved world champions Paulie Malignaggi and Austin Trout have all fought under the promotional banner. But they could land their biggest signing to date in pound-for-pound pound queen of women's boxing, Shields, if the money is right. Asked if she would consider a move to BKFC, Shields told TalkSport.com, I don't like the idea of fighting with bare knuckles. It sounds bad coming from me, but it is brutal. That being said, the fighter spirit in me says that if they come with the right amount of money, I will get in there and fight bare knuckle. But it has to be a million dollars or a million and a half. You've got to come with a million. I know I've got great hands, but knowing that someone is going to be punching me with bare knuckles, well just look at this face, this face looks good. Are you telling me I've got to risk that because you guys want to see me in bare knuckle, and you want to be entertained? Listen, I want to be entertained and I want a million dollars to go in there and entertain them. If they've got that money for me we can make it happen, because I am the best boxer in the world, but if you want the best boxer in the world to fight bare knuckle show me the money, a lot of it. Shields, the first two-weight undisputed champion of the four-belt era, has defeated every boxer she has ever faced both as a professional and an amateur. She has already held world titles at light middleweight, middleweight and super middleweight, but the 29-year-old is now aiming to become a four-weight world champion by beating WBC heavyweight champion Vanessa Lepage Jonas on July 27. The fight is being contested at 175 pounds, the light heavyweight limit, and will be for the vacant WBO light heavyweight title as well. She wants the money. She wants the money. I don't blame her. So if she wants to do that, and, and that bare knuckle is just so brutal. It is something. But right now, uh, Natasha is going to talk about uh, the latest news from uh, Innerway. So let's hear this on the Show to Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. The following article was written for The Ring Magazine by Jake Donovan. Naya Inoue officially has his marching orders. The ring and undisputed 122-pound king was ordered to next face WBA mandatory challenger Murodjan Akmadaliyev. 
both parties were instructed to enter a 30-day negotiation period to reach terms. The World Boxing Association, WBA, Championships Committee ordered the mandatory bout, the sanctioning body announced on Thursday. The pioneer organization sent the official communication to the parties and gave them 30 days to negotiate, which will end on July 14. Inoue is co-promoted by Ohashi Promotions and Top Rank. Akhmadaliyev is with Matchroom Boxing and World of Boxing. Per WBA Championships Rule C.10, tiplists must honor his mandatory within nine months from when they claimed the belt. Inoue, 27-0, 24 knockouts, fully unified the division when he knocked out Marlon Tapales, 38, and 4 with 20 knockouts, in the 10th round last December 26 in Tokyo. The ring's number 2 rated pound for pound fighter defended his WBC and WBO titles while he earned the WBA and IBF belts. Yokohama's Inoue also re-established ring championship lineage with the win. He followed up with a thrilling sixth-round knockout of Louis Neri, 35 and 2 with 27 knockouts, on May 6 at the Tokyo Dome. Inoue had to survive the first knockdown of his career, in the opening round, to storm back and brutalize Neri into submission. IBF mandatory challenger Sam Goodman, 18-0, 8 KOs, was ringside and made a point to demand a fight with Inoue. The unbeaten Aussie contender, has softened his stance and will instead pursue a stay-busy fight. The 2016 Olympic bronze medalist dethroned Daniel Roman via split decision in their January 2020 thriller in Miami Gardens, Florida. Just three defenses followed in a reign stalled by injuries and illness. Akhmadaliyev lost the belts to Tap Ailes in a disputed split decision last April 8 in San Antonio, Texas. He immediately made his way back to mandatory challenger status one fight later. Akhmadaliyev stopped unbeaten Kevin Gonzalez in the eighth round of their WBA title eliminator last December 16 in Glendale, Arizona. Inoue previously mentioned Akhmadaliyev as part of his three-fight plan for 2024, all at junior featherweight. The hope is to stage the fight in September. However, it is likely no longer part of Turkey Alalshika's first show in the United Kingdom. Inoue has won titles at 108, 115, 118 and 122. He became Japan's first ever undisputed champion in the four-belt era when he fully unified the bantamweight division. One fight later, Inoue was the first Japanese fighter to win major titles in four divisions with a one-sided knockout win over Stephen Fulton last July. The WBC, WBO, 122-pound title win saw Inoue also become Japan's first two-division unified titlist. He added more history for his nation with his win over Tap Ailes to claim undisputed championship status in two weight divisions. Thank you, Natasha. And I got to say, um, in the previous um, discussion she had there, I want to say in this set up, you know, Natasha's trying. And a lot of folks on here are trying, but sometimes she bu- brutalizes, like you just heard me, brutalize the word brutalize. But um, she met Polly Malanaji. She said Polly Malanaji, something like that. But, you know, she's trying her best. We're not going to fire her yet. But anyway, we're going to get to... Uh, her next uh, story, and by the way, this fight that she's talking about will have occurred probably by the time most of you hear this. But let's hear what she has to say about it. David Benavides is resigned to the fact he is unlikely to ever get a shot at undisputed 168-pound champion Saul Canelo Alvarez. The 27-year-old from Phoenix... Arizona has long been lobbying for fight against Mexican superstar Alvarez, 33, to no avail. Benavides will instead face Oleksandr Gvozdik for the vacant WBC interim light heavyweight title on the undercard of the WBA lightweight title fight between Javonta Tank Davis and Frank Martin at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada on Saturday night. I really don't care about Canelo, Benavides said at the final press conference. If he didn't want to get the fight at 168, 
We are at 175 now, and we are looking to face the best here. The better the competition gets for me, the better I get myself. That's why I've never shied away from no hard fights. I've been working with world champions since I was 14 years old and the best has always come out of me. When the bright lights get turned on, I always show up. Oleksandr Gvozdik is a great fighter. I'm prepared for him. We actually sparred when I was 21 years old. I know he's in the best shape of his life. We've got two warriors going up against each other. We had a hell of a sparring session, three sparring sessions, to be exact. Benavidez's father and trainer sang from the same hymn book in an interview with Fight Hub TV. I believe that there's bigger fights to be made, David Benavidez Sr. said of a potential showdown with Alvarez. Dmitry Bivol beat Canelo Alvarez, so we are trying to beat the one that beat the one. I think it would be an honor for us to fight Bivol because he beat Zerda Ramirez, he beat Canelo Alvarez. So if we can be the one to beat the face of boxing I think that would put David in a greater position than where we are now. We are trying to look for the bigger fighters, the dangerous fighters, the fighters that nobody really wants to face. So those are the ones that we are after. Alexander has nothing to lose, you know, a lot to gain. If we beat Alexander we are not going to get the credit that we deserve, he only has one loss, bro. So like I said, he's not a pushover. We trained extremely hard to look spectacular, not just to win the fight. We are going to try to hurt him, we are going to see what we can do and put him out. I think we sparred him about six years ago. I like what David did in that sparring, he looked spectacular, he looked really good against a guy who was already a big fighter at that time. And now he made a lot of changes and I think he's going to look even better than back then. Yeah, I think David is being uh, blocked out by Canelo. I mean, David beat Ben Benitez, he can fight. He can fight, he's young. I mean, Canelo's 33, David's now, what, 27. And um, I think they're trying to block him out. But if the Saudi money comes there, if it comes through at some point, I think those two will fight. And I think uh, the Saturday that Ben Benitez will easily win that fight. And I also think that Tank Davis, he's going to, I think in under four rounds, he's going to beat, he's going to knock out Frank Martin and hold me to that. But anyway, we got one more uh, thing here, article. And this is uh, from... Um, our buddy, Knockout Nigel, and he loves to talk about the history of boxing. So he talks about what happened on this day and on this week in boxing. So let's hear Knockout Nigel on the Show the Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. June 15th, 1984. Thomas Hearns stopped Roberto Duran in the second round to retain his WBC super welterweight title at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Hearns, a two-to-one favorite in his second title defense, dropped Duran twice in the final 30 seconds of round one before ending the fight with a crushing right hand that sent Duran tumbling face-first into the canvas. June 17, 1954 Rocky Marciano beat Ezard Charles by unanimous decision to retain his World Heavyweight Championship in a high-action thriller at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, New York. Making his third title defense, Marciano was taken 15 rounds for the only time in his career by Charles, who failed in his second attempt to become the first former heavyweight champion to regain the world title. The fighters met in a rematch at Yankee Stadium three months later, when Marciano scored an eighth-round KO in the ring's fight of the year. June 17, 1979. Danny Lopez knocked out Mike Ayala in round 15 to retain his WBC featherweight title at the Convention Center Arena in San Antonio. After Ayala took an early lead in the back-and-forth contest, which the ring named Fight of the Year, Little Red sent the hometown challenger to a knee in both the 7th and 11th rounds. Referee Carlos Padilla waved an end to the bout after the second knockdown, but the fight was resumed after the timekeeper said Ayala got up at the count of nine. 
Lopez finished the job in the 15th, though, when he dropped Ayala in the corner with a pair of hard rights. June 18, 1941. Joe Louis knocked out Billy Conn in round 13 to retain his World Heavyweight Championship before a crowd of 54,487 at New York's Polo Grounds in one of the greatest title fights of all time. Lewis was an 11-5 favorite entering his 18th title defense and outweighed the former light heavyweight champion by about 30 pounds, but Conn was ahead on two of the three scorecards and even on the third after staggering the Brown Bomber in round 12. Conn pressed on for the knockout in the 13th, but Louis landed a series of hard rights and finished the challenger with a right to the head in the ring's fight of the year. For some reason, knockout Nigel loves to call Joe Lewis Joe Louis. I don't know. I don't know why he does that. But, you know, I can't believe that the hearns Duran fight was 40 years ago. I mean, I, I, I was looking at that like it was last week. And if you've never seen that fight, go on YouTube and check it out. I mean, that, you know, it doesn't last that long, but Hearns puts a right hand on Duran that, you know, I think Duran now, 40 years later, probably still feels it. And if you've ever read uh, Duran's autobiography, it's so funny because if you read the biography, it's like uh, he never lost the fight. In his autobiography, he talks about all his wins, but he never mentions any fight that he lost, and he definitely does not mention a fight with the, with the Hearns. In fact, I had a very good friend in Denver. He was a huge Duran fan, as I am too, because I think Duran's something. And Duran's really a nice guy. And I had the opportunity to meet him, have him on my show in Denver. But I used to always tease my buddy about every time that uh, he would say something about Duran being the best ever, I would say, well, what about that Hearns fight? And he just get real quiet. But that, you know, that's, that's hard to believe, 40 years ago. And, I, you know, I started thinking, too, which right hand was the hardest that Hearns threw? The one that he hit Duran with or the one that he hit Pepino Cuevas with? Because, I mean, Cuevas was, I mean, he was out, too, just like Duran. But I might check that out on the... Uh, YouTube, and let me know what you think. I'm going to go back and look at that fight again. But anyway, we're going to get to the fight at hand right now. This is the Father's Day special in the junior middleweight division. This is going to be the sons of two legends. And I'm talking about Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. versus Corey Spinks. Now, I know some of you right now are already saying, you know, Leon Spinks wasn't a legend. Yeah, but he was... Heavyweight champion in the world. He had his five moments, five minutes of fame. You got to give him that. And he was a good fighter. He didn't, you know, he didn't become what a lot of people thought when he came out of the Olympics. And he's Olympic champion, gold medal champion. Can't, you could take that away from him. But Julio Cesar Chavez Sr., I mean, he's one of the legendary, one of the all time great fighters. I mean, that's a different level there. And when you talk about Mexican fighters, that's the epitome there, Chavez. I mean, he was, he's just something. Just a, he's just an amazing fighter. If you don't know any, if you're listening to this program for the first time, just curious about boxing, go check out Chavez's fights. Just check them out just to see. But this is what we have today. We're going to have Knockout Nigel from, I believe, in Medicine Square Garden on Father's Day. Father's Day special. And he's going to be the commentator for the Chavez Jr. versus Spinks fight. And Knockout, by the way, he is getting a lot of press and everything. He's, I'm trying to keep it from going through his head because he's getting a little getting a little bit big-headed when he comes back to the studio here. He's kind of strutting around. And a lot of the other reporters and all, they kind of look at him like, you know, come on. Give, you know, we're going to take your bubbly if, if, something, if you keep doing that. But anyway, let's get to this fight now. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. versus Corey Spinks on the Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. Cheers. This is Knockout Nigel, your humble commentator, coming to you from the father of boxing venues, 
Madison Square Garden in New York City to witness a special Father's Day junior middleweight bout between the sons of two boxing legends, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. and Corey Spinks. Julio Sr. is considered one of the greatest fighters ever and the gold standard for what being a Mexican fighter meant. Leon Spinks, on the other hand, did not reach the lofty heights of Chavez, but he was the heavyweight champion of the world for a brief period and was an Olympic gold medalist. Their sons both became world champions in their respective divisions. This should be a corker of a match, as we have the classic boxer in Spinks versus the classic slugger in Chavez. The arena is half full. I guess the fathers had other things to do besides come to this match on Father's Day. The judges for this ten-rounder will be Harold Letterman, Julie Letterman and Jerry Roth. The fight will be on the ten-point system. The man in charge in the ring will be Tony Perez. I would like to wish all you dads out there Happy Father's Day. I have been given a special bottle of bubbly found in the basement of the original Madison Square Garden. It was rumoured that this bubbly was once owned by Al Capone. I was really hoping for some fresh bubbly, but I was given this. Oh well, I will go without for now, as the bell sounds for round one. Even though this is a junior middleweight bout, it appears that Chavez has made a number of visits to McDonald's since yesterday's weigh-in. He made the weight yesterday, but now he looks like he is ready to fight a cruiser weight. Spinks comes out and circles Chavez. He immediately clinches Chavez before he can get off a punch. Given the weight difference, Spinks' strategy may be to hold and move. Spinks flicks out a right jab from his southpaw stance that misses Chavez. Chavez pushes Spinks into the ropes and lands a four-point left hook that causes a cut above Spinks' left eye. A trickle of blood is seeping down his face. Spinks misses a combination. Chavez misses a combo as well at ring center. Chavez misses with a left jab. Spinks clinches. Chavez breaks out the clinch and is met with a two-point right uppercut. Chavez attempts a left hook that Spinks expertly ducked. Spinks scores with a three-point right jab. He circles Chavez and paws at his left eye. Chavez is looking for another opening. He accidentally steps on Spinks' foot as the bell ends round one. Even though Chavez opened up a cut over Spinks' left eye, Spinks' flashier boxing technique won him the round, but barely. Spinks had five points to four for Chavez. I am really tempted to open this bubbly, but I dare not, because it is an antique from the 1930s. I will substitute the bubbly for now with some pop rocks as the bell sounds for round two. Chavez is trying to cut off the ring like his father used to. Spinks is very slippery. Unlike his dad, he is a classic stick and move boxer. Chavez changes his stance and has become a southpaw too. He catches Spinks with a three-point right lead that knocks him into the far ropes. Spinks attempts to clinch, but Chavez muscles him away. Chavez unleashes a classic three-point left hook that sends Spinks to the canvas. Referee Perez begins the count. Spinks jumps up at the count of two. He doesn't appear hurt. Perez asks if he is okay, and Spinks says yes. Spinks goes on the offensive with a two-point right jab and three-point right hook that snaps Chavez's head back and causes him to clinch. Chavez comes out of the clinch with a three-point left cross. Spinks returns with a three-point right cross. Despite the knockdown, Spinks is not afraid to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Chavez. Chavez lands a three-point left hook. Spinks' cut has not reopened. Spinks throws a right jab that misses. Chavez misses with a left hook as the bell ends round three. Chavez did win the second due to the knockdown, but Spinks came back strong and almost stole the round. Chavez had twelve points to eight points for Spinks. Let me knock down some more pop rocks. Nothing can replace my bubbly, but this will do for now. Round three begins with them meeting at ring centre. Spinks lands a four-point double right jab and two-point left hook that backs Chavez up. Spinks misses a follow-up combination. Chavez misses a left hook to the body. Spinks is bobbing and weaving. 
Chavez steps forward to land a two-point left hook to the head that opens up the cut. Spinks paws at the cut left eye and then misses a right jab. Chavez switches to southpaw again and misses with a right cross. Spinks lands a three-point stiff right jab. Chavez moves forward and misses with a left hook, then headbutts Spinks on the ropes. Referee Perez immediately issues a stern warning Chavez. Chavez nods to Spinks, who nods back as the bell sounds to end round three. It appeared that Spinks won the round. The weight difference has become a factor. While Spinks' punches have more snap, Chavez is the one with the heavier blows. In the third round, Spinks had nine points to two for Julio Jr. My dear, I have run out of pop rocks. I will flag the attendant down to see if he can issue me another bag as round four begins. The boxers meet at ring center. Chavez grabs Spinks in a bear hug. The referee separates the two. I believe Chavez is a little winded. Maybe the cheeseburgers and fries are catching up to him. He misses a wild left hook that Spinks easily ducked under. Spinks scores a two-point right jab, followed by a left cross for three points. Chavez tries to cover up, but is met with a four-point right hook to the stomach and a three-point left cross. Chavez stumbles back into the neutral corner. Spinks scores a two-point right cross, but misses the follow-up combo. Chavez's corner is screaming at him to get out of the corner. Spinks lands a three-point right jab, followed by a two-point right cross. Chavez appears exhausted. Spinks misses with a combo. Spinks has his right cross blocked by Chavez's forearm. Spinks misses with a double jab. He may have punched himself out. He falls into Chavez, who clinches. The fighters are separated by Perez. Spinks is on his toes, moving from left to right, then right to left. Spinks is trying to get his energy level back. Chavez is plodding along, looking like he is ready to fall. Spinks fires off a three-point right jab. Chavez clinches again. Perez breaks them and tells Chavez to stop holding or he will take a point away. Chavez steps forward and lands a four-point left hook to the body and head. Those headshots opened up Spinks' cut over his left eye. Blood is streaming down his face as the bell ends round four. Spinks poured on the gas in that round. He clearly won it. He had 22 points to only four for Chavez. But once again, it appeared that Chavez's one punch did more damage than all of Spinks in the fourth. Spinks sat down heavily on his stool. He felt the effect of that one punch, and I am feeling the effects of no bubbly. I must open this old bubbly soon before I starve from thirst. The bell has sounded for round five. The fighters meet at ring center. Maybe both have gotten a second wind and plan to slug it out. Spinks barely misses a right jab to Chavez's temple. Chavez returns with a five-point left hook that buckles Spinks' knees. Spinks fires back a four-point straight right. Spinks misses with a right jab. Oh, my word. Chavez lands a crushing four-point left hook that knocks Spinks flat on his stomach. Spinks' corner enter the ring to throw in the towel, but there is no need to. Their fighter is stone cold out. At 151 of the fifth round, the winner by knockout is Julio Cesar Chavez, Jr. Chavez, gets on his knees to see if Spinks is all right. Once he sees that he is, Chavez sprawls out on the mat. He is exhausted. I think he may go to sleep in there. His father, who is training for a fight to be heard soon on this channel and could not be here, would have been proud of that left hook. He taught his son well. I don't care what anyone says. I'm going to open this bubbly before I go in the ring. <sighs> huh? I got the bottle open. Let me pour some... What is this? There is no bubbly in this bottle. It is empty. There is some sort of note in here. Oh, the paper has yellowed for so many years. It reads, This is Al Capone. If you are reading, it means I am dead. I want the reader to know that I buried all my stolen loot at... What? The bottom of the note is gone. 
some sort of insect got in this supposedly airtight bottom and chewed up the bottom of the letter. My God! I would have been rich. I would have had Capone's riches. I could have purchased an endless supply of bubbly. Oh, drat! I could have been the richest man in the world. Let me return you to our Bangkok studio. This is Knockout Nigel, your humble commentator. Cheers! Oh, drat! I could have been the bubbly king. An endless supply of bubbly. Oh, drat! That's a scary thought, uh, Knockout Nigel being the richest man in the world. That is scary enough that you got Elon Musk. But, it, oh, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that fight today. You love we're putting on these fantasy fights. And, you know, so many other people do. And I want to say hi because I haven't done this. I have a lot of folks listening in in Germany. And I want to say hi to you folks. And if you, wherever you're listening to the program, whatever viral, uh, if you're using your phone, if you're on YouTube, wherever you are, as other people do, if you want to uh, suggest a fight, and I got German fighters too, just let me know. Drop me a line or wherever you listen to the program, be it on YouTube, somewhere in the viral sphere, somewhere where you're listening to this program. Just drop me a line, as so many other people do, and become a promoter. Become, you know, join the Patreon, be a Patreon member like uh, Al, Al Red Sox fan. I, I'm being hesitant because uh, they're doing some building in front of our place right now, and I don't want any uh, noise to distract uh, from this program. But, yeah. Just like our Red Sox fan who's a promoter of this program and a Patreon, you too can become one. Go to patreon.com, look for Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast, and contribute a dollar a month, whatever you can do. And also go, as I mentioned before, buymeacoffee.com, and just contribute whatever you can. So we can keep the lights on, keep the equipment going, get another microphone, you know, uh, Get some more AI assistance, <laughs> whatever, you know. Just you know, but we just have fun here and I hope you enjoy the programs as so many people have said to me thus far. But we also do music on the show. We do a lot of music and we do what's a lot of folks with music that you've never heard before. But we're gonna go and we just go a little bit everywhere with the music. And I'm gonna start right now with uh, the great saxophone player, Lester Young and Billy Holiday. This is from the early forties and and it's kind of the motto of this program, getting some fun out of life. So let's hear that on the Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. <laughs>
chicken and rice. All of those dishes are mighty nice. Gather around, you girls, and listen to me. I want to tell you about my baby's recipe. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. There's a gal named Miss Fanny Brown. She cooks the best gumbo in this town. All of you chicks can really cook. But Fanny Brown's learned something you don't learn in the books. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. 99 times I've tried to eat all those fine fancy cuts of country meat. Just can't eat a single bite. I just don't have the appetite. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. She wouldn't give no one a pudding but me Yeah, she promised me She wouldn't give no one a pudding but me But I don't believe her I'll just have to wait and see Gonna watch my baby both night and day So she won't give my pudding away My baby's pudding is all she owns So there ain't no meat for Henry Jones. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. I like my baby's pudding. I like it best of all. Well, I guess that song will get me kicked off YouTube or somewhere. But anyway, no, I always play that song. I've been doing it for years. And it's uh, Winona Harris, the great Winona Harris. And I like my baby's pudding. And before that, we played another song that could get me off, kicked off uh, YouTube or somewhere. Because there's some countries, actually, when I play some of this music, I get these little notes saying, this song is banned in this country. Oh, this song is banned here. But anyway, I play them anyway. Let's see what happens. And before that, we did uh, Fats Noel and Ride Daddy Ride. And before that, we did Howlin' Wolf. I love me some Howlin' Wolf. And Hold On to Your Money. You better do that. And before that, we did a group that I grew up listening to. And I thought this was a a black woman who was singing the lead on this. We found out it was just like this. Young white guy when I was a kid in elementary school. And the song is uh, Bread and Butter by the New Beats. And check out the New Beats sometime on uh, YouTube if you've never seen them. Because they're kind of, uh, you look at it and it's like, really? But anyway, I, I've always just liked that song. But anyway, and we started to set off with uh, Billie Holiday and Lester Young on the saxophone. And that was getting some fun out of life. And I hope that you done that, that you always do that. Get fun out of life. Do what you can. Because, you know, this is, um, there's a lot of wars going on, a lot of tension, and you know, throughout the world. But do what you can. Do what you can to make the world a better place. We're on this sphere together. So every day, when you get up, just get up, look in the mirror, hug yourself, and say, I love myself. And if you're sight impaired, Get up and just hug yourself and say you love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you can't do anything. You can't help anyone because you can't help yourself. But we all are on this little sphere together in this vast, vast universe, this solar system. So do what you can, wherever you are in this world, to make it a better place. Bring some positive energy there. But we're going to get out of here right now. 
This is Greg Rashid. Go in love and go in peace. And do what you can to make your area a better place. And if you want to be a promoter on a program, just drop me a line. Because we do fantasy fights and we just have fun here. And if there's any music that you want to hear, if I have it, I will play it. But again, go in love and go in peace. Enjoy, if you're, if you're listening to this on Father's Day, if you're a father, and even if you're not a father, just enjoy the day. Just enjoy the day. Do what you can to make the world, your area, for that moment, a better place. That's all we can ask. Just make it a better place. So I will be seeing you next time on the Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. Are you tired? Thanks for tuning in, my friends. See you next time for another edition of the Shoulder Roll Virtual Boxing Podcast. Please don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe to this podcast. Thanks.